invitation song? I'll fly away. Uh, I don't take songs. I'll fly away. <laughs> I just wanted to pick one song I knew today. He is just too cute. <laughs> Well, good evening, everybody. As we come back together to, to worship God here in spirit and truth, it's uh, always great to come together as we encourage one another and have this opportunity to spend some time lifting each other up and uh, just you know giving praises to God. Uh, tonight, we're going to look at a lesson uh, about baptism. Does baptism save us? And it's based on some conversations I've had the last couple days, based on a conversation, two conversations, that I had even this morning uh, after worship service. And so uh, for those of you who may be watching at home, we welcome you. But also want to just say that we're going to enter now into a Bible study. Uh, that will be at the conclusion of the, of the actual service itself. And so, um, you know, you're all allowed to, to ask questions and, and make comments. Just please raise your hands, as I often ask. Does baptism save us? This is something that's such a crucial concept. You know, because there's, there's those, when you have these conversations with, uh, in the religious world, especially in Christendom, obviously we know that there's individuals who don't believe uh, that baptism saves you. And they'll say, you know what I mean? And, and when you ask them to show you some passages of Scripture, they'll say, uh, you know, why they believe that baptism isn't necessary. Sometimes they'll say, well, where does it say that baptism is necessary? Oh, well, I'm glad you asked. How many verses do you need? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is one good enough or would you like, you know, a half dozen, right? And so it, it's just, you know, honestly, I, it just amazes me that people who have spent their life studying, you know, people who have uh, various degrees in theology, and they, 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 they don't see this most basic teaching. And, I, and it just blows my mind. I can't understand it. And so... This evening, we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and 21, but we're also going to discuss baptism as an antitype for uh, salvation. Uh, we're going to talk about what an antitype is in a minute, but we're also going to look at baptism as Christ's method for salvation, and we're going to look at baptism as man's response to said salvation. And so, brothers and sisters, it's crucial that each of us understands these concepts not just to be able to understand it uh, so much internally, but uh, understand it to the point to where you can now teach it. You can now uh, speak to individuals about what the scriptures teach, where you can find book, chapter, verse when it comes to this. Because there's really, uh, there's not too many more uh, important topics that you're going to have Bible studies uh, about than this, right? Uh, how does one become a member of the Lord's church? Uh, at what point is somebody saved? And so every person is, who is not baptized should want to be baptized. You know, we have, uh, I think about even our teens, right, who have been sitting in Bible studies for many years now. And we have many of our teens who are still not baptized, right? And so I would ask some questions of you here tonight. Uh, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And if you believe that Jesus Christ is, in the, is the Son of God, do you know that's all you need to, uh, to do to be baptized is to have a belief? That's where it all begins. Jesus says in Mark 16, 15, and 16, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And so, you, you know, you think about it's going to be a, a journey for the rest of your life. You're going to be continuously learning and growing and maturing in the Scriptures. But as we think about the Scriptures here tonight, we'll start in 1 Peter chapter 3. In verse 21, brethren, because it tells us so very clearly here, corresponding to that baptism now saves you, that not the removal of the dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, brethren, many in the religious world do not believe that baptism saves us. Many believe that they can just be a good person. Show me one passage of scripture in, uh, in the Holy Writ where it says, just be a good person and you'll be saved. Show me one passage. Can somebody give me one passage that says, just be a good person and that's all you need for salvation. You see, it's not there. You won't find it. But I could, I could show you passages of scripture that are absolutely there and that shows you exactly what God requires for salvation. And so... Uh, to, con to the contrary, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter tells us that baptism now saves us. And the Apostle Peter, he did not... Uh, well, let me go back for a second. 
So earlier at the, in my closing and in my invitation, I, I mentioned for, uh, for a moment Cornelius. Uh, and when, when exactly was Cornelius saved, right? Uh, it wasn't when he believed, right? Because he believed and he did many wonderful works. Even the Jews were saying, man, he does, he does so, he's done so much for the Jewish people. He's done, he's done so much. He's, uh, he's given so much of his resources and his time. He was in prayer on the, on the ninth hour of the day. That's when the Jews prayed, right? And we know that his, his prayers, he must have been a righteous God because his prayers uh, became front and center before the Father, right? And so his prayers were answered. An angel is sent to him to send for Simon Peter, who, will, who, will, uh, and who, who Simon understood. He understood the, the assignment, so to speak. And when he came, what did he do? He told him words in which he must be saved by. But while he's speaking... What happens? The Holy Spirit came upon them. And when the Holy Spirit came upon them, were they saved at that point? They've already received gifts from the Holy Spirit in, this, in the form of power, right? The power of the Holy Spirit came upon them. In Acts chapter 10 and 11, it talks about just like it came upon the apostles in Acts chapter 2. But yet, were they still saved? No, they still weren't saved at this point. So you had individuals who believed. And who was better than Cornelius? Cornelius had said that he was, he was a man... Um, that was faithful unto God uh, and who lived his life in service to God even though he was a Roman centurion. And so this is a man who had belief. This is a man who believed so much that God sent an angel specifically to him. This was an individual who had, uh, had been benevolent. Uh, and this is an individual who the Holy Spirit came upon and he still needed to be baptized for the remission of his sins. And so brothers and sisters, we know that uh, baptism now saves us. And some have asked for this verse, and that is the verse that you need to show them. So let's start tonight by just kind of, that's setting the stage, but let's start tonight with the idea that baptism is an antitype. Well, what is an antitype? It's simply something that corresponds to something of, similar, of a similar pattern. So in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20, what do we see? We, we, we see them talking about the waters of the flood. If you want to open up, you can turn there. But he's talking about the waters of the flood in, in chapter 3 and verse 20 of 1 Peter. And is being compared to the waters of baptism. Noah and his family were saved through water, just like we now are saved through water. And so Peter calls, for, calls the water baptism the antitype, so to speak, of the flood water. And the water of the flood saved those eight souls that we learn about in Genesis chapter 6 through 9. And so, brethren, God saved Noah and his family from a sin-filled world through water. In Genesis 6 and 12 it says, God looked on the earth and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. But we learn that the waters of baptism save us from a sin-filled world. And just as waters in Noah's day saved his family from a sin-filled world. So the Apostle John, he tells us that this world is sinful. Look over to 1 John for a second in chapter 2. In 1 John in chapter 2, I want you to look at verse 15 uh, through 17. It's important, brothers and sisters, that we understand these things because we need to be able to teach our children. We need to be able to teach our friends, our co-workers, this important information. To let them know what God requires of them. What were we talking about this morning during Bible study? We were talking about a God-ordained pattern, right? A pattern for the church. We were talking about not only for uh, how to replicate, how to uh, duplicate the church here in the 21st century by following the pattern. We were also looking at uh, the idea that God has given us the plan of salvation. Carrie? Yep. They want to themselves, so they have to become rebaptized or do they No. They don't have to become rebaptized. If you're a Christian and you're baptized for the remission of your sins and then you, you fall away for a time, which many have and many continue to do, you yes, we ask that you would be restored to the church. You're basically making a public confession that you wish to uh, to, 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 to 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 change your life and to rededicate your life to Christ. It's like when it's, you know, we take your confession when you're baptized, right? And you're doing what? You're confessing Jesus, right? Confessing your faith and your belief that Jesus is the Son of God. And so you don't have to be rebaptized. You simply just need to ask God for forgiveness and, uh, and make, the, make it known to the church and to the elders that you wish to rededicate your life. And they'll pray with you. 
and they'll help you and they'll study with you. Lewis? But the key is also when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit at yep. the time, he doesn't reissue the Holy Spirit every time. Yeah. You know, we get it one time. Yeah, you're sealed. You breathe the Holy Spirit and run him off. That's yeah. a different story. But God says you don't have the Holy Spirit that even acts, motivates you to come back to him because he's still in you. Yeah. dwells in you. Absolutely. Look over to 1 John, as I said, uh, chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. So the question you have to ask yourself is, what is the will of God? What does God require? What does God require of those who are looking to come out of the world and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? To come out of the world through the, and receive salvation through baptism, right? We know that you have to hear the word, Romans 10, 17, right? You have to determine if you believe it. You have to, uh, you have to repent. You have to confess you have to be baptized, but then you have to live unfaithfully. Look at Romans chapter 6 now. In Romans chapter 6, we're going to look at a few verses here uh, that kind of talks about how we are baptized into Christ. And we have a few of our teens here with us tonight, and I want you guys to know, you, and if we have any of our adults who are not baptized yet as well, that it begins with, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that's all you need to, uh, to have in order to be baptized. You're gonna, it's going to be the rest of your life. You're going to continue to learn and to grow. I'm still learning and growing. I still learn as I talk with my elders, as I talk with uh, uh, Russ on Friday, and as we have various conversations. You know, it's, it, you're going to be learning and being mentored for the rest of your life by various people. And in Romans chapter 6, notice what it says in verse uh, 3 through 6. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so, too, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, baptism meaning, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, meaning that we're raised up from the water a new creation. Knowing this, it says in verse 6, that our old self was crucified with Christ in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Brothers and sisters, you look at this information, you look at these passages. Baptism is the line, is the line dividing Christians from non-Christians. Amen? Amen? It is the line that divides Christians from non-Christians. Baptism is the line dividing the saved from the lost. Baptism is the line dividing the saint from the sinner. You can't come out of the world except to be washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And the only way you can be washed by the blood of Jesus Christ is in that baptistry. And if you go down into that baptistry, your sins will be forgiven you. We understand, brethren, that, the, that baptism is, a, is kind of that dividing line between the saint and in, in, in the sinner, right? Those who are saved and those who are lost. Remember, Noah and his family were separated from the world by what? The water. By the water. That's right. And the ark that they were in is a type of church. It's one of the types of the church, right? Remember this morning's Bible study? You got the ark that Noah built. You got the, uh, the ark of the covenant that uh, Moses built. And you also have the temple that David uh, passed the plans on to Solomon and Solomon built. Those are all types of churches, right? And they were saved through water in the same way that we're saved through water. But how did Noah and, uh, and his family get into the ark? God had given him at the, at the right time and in the right moment the, uh, the, the information that he needed. And then he entered the ark with all the animals. And it says God shuts the door behind him and they were saved through water. What happens to us in Acts chapter 2 when we are baptized? Those 3,000 who were pricked to the heart and they were baptized. What were they added to? The church. The church. Who added them to the church? God added them to the church. And he, it's like he shut the door behind them in that ark that he got into. 
And that's what 1 Peter 3, 20, 21 is talking about in those previous verses as well. Today, in like manner, brethren, Christians are separated from the world and we're saved by water. Let's look at another uh, idea. Christ, uh, Christ's method for salvation. Ask yourself, why did Peter say that baptism saves us? Well, the answer is very simple. Peter received instructions teaching uh, uh, instructions in regards to Jesus' teachings by way of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14 and verse 26, the Holy Scriptures tell us, but the, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance everything that I ever said to you. But why did Peter remember uh, that Jesus said that? Because Peter was one of the apostles. He was one of the eyewitnesses. He was there uh, for uh, Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. He was there when Jesus said, I have all authority in heaven and on earth, and I need you to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that had commanded you. And lo, I am with you. I am with you, even till the end of the age. He didn't say, just, hey, just be a good person. He didn't say just, you know, try to, try to do some good things for people and, and you know what, I'm a God of love and mercy and, and, and I'll, let it, I'll let the rest slide in the end. Well, the Spirit does the same thing for us through the Word. Yes. If we're faithful, we're Absolutely. Bodily. Absolutely. It, it, it helps us with the understanding yep. that we can become stronger and, and better at understanding God's Word. Amen. Flip over your Bibles to Mark chapter 16 now. This is a passage I know that we all know, but I'm going, to, I'm going to show it to you again anyways. Because, brethren, there are too many people who think they just have to believe. And if I, if I believe that Jesus is the Christ and I say this prayer, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? The sinner's prayer. That sinner prayer is not, made, it's not in the Bible. A man made that up literally, I think it was like in the 18, 1900s. 18, 1900 years after the Lord's church started, a man made up this idea of a sinner's prayer, and now all of a sudden it's, it's, it's become a mainstay in much of Christendom, in various denominations. Not all of them, but several of them, several of the main denominations. But Mark 16, 15 and 16, Jesus says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And what does it say? He who has believed and has been baptized. Is it one or the one in the same, or, or is it one or the other, or is it both? It's both. it's both. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved will be condemned. Well, it means that you'll be condemned because if you don't believe, well, you're surely not going to be baptized then. Why would you be baptized if you don't believe in the first place, right? And so, brethren, it's such an important concept. It's so very important. And the reason why I'm, I'm passionate about this tonight is I can't tell you as a minister how many conversations I had with, I've had with people who just say, I, but you know, I just want to, I want to know everything. I want to know more. And then there's nothing wrong with wanting to know more. But the problem is, is you don't know when you're going to die. We're praying for uh, one of the, uh, one of Cody's friends right now. I've asked you guys for prayers for Owen, right? And I don't know what his current situation is, but I can tell you the last update I received, 16-year-old kid, he's on a vacation with his family in Louisville. He dives into the lake. He dives headfirst into the lake, and guess what he dove into? A bunch of, bunch of, a bunch of rocks and heavy stones. It basically uh, uh, snapped his neck, uh, severe spinal injuries, and at this point he's on life support, and he has no feeling in any of his limbs, 16 years old. Do you think when he went on his family vacation he was expecting to possibly be struggling for his life and he's still in the hospital and he's still he's still literally day by day and so brethren why do I say all these things I say these things because if you believe that Jesus is the Christ the son of the living God that's all you need to be baptized and then as you grow and mature in your faith you the, the Holy Spirit as you read and you study and as you grow he'll help you to unlock the more more inner uh, the deeper things of God, if you will. There's a reason why it says that when you're first baptized, you're on the milk of the word. Because you're a babe in Christ. But as you grow, you're going to then understand the more <coughs> deeper things of God. The meat of the word, if you will. You're able to then digest those things. 
So brethren, John, in chapter 3 and verse 5, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. It doesn't say, if you're, unless, you, uh, unless you believe and you live a good life, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's not what it says. It says, unless you believe and are baptized, right? You have to be um, looking at that passage again. You have to, uh, unless one is born of water and spirit. And that's what it's talking about. Because you're born, again, as you come up out of the water, you bury the old man of sin, you bring up the new, uh, the new being, the new creation out of the water, and you receive the spirit. So you're born of water and spirit. And isn't it interesting that many people like to look at John 3.16? Right? They look at John, see, you just got to believe. But what were the previous ten verses talking about? Obedience. It was talking about obedience. It was talking about baptism <laughs> as he's having this conversation with Nicodemus. Brothers and sisters, if you believe that you were saved before you were baptized, then you don't believe what the scriptures teach. Amen. Because 1 Peter chapter 3 and 21 says that baptism now saves us. And if you believe that you were saved before or you can be saved before baptism, your beliefs are contrary to God's holy word. And can we, can we be saved if what we believe is contrary to God's holy word? It gets back to that pattern conversation we're having this morning. It gets back to the idea of, of understanding that God has given us a pattern of teachings for what the church should look like, how we can identify the church, and how mankind can be saved. What thoughts do you have? Diane. Well, I, I go back to that wonderful sermon in Democracy. Because we are under a monarchy. He says you have to do both. You have yep. to do both. You can't just go. Well, but it says back here, we can interpret it this way. No, that's what it says. Yeah. This is black and white. I'm pretty sure that's not great. Yeah. So you either do it or you don't. Yeah. I don't know how somebody can make it any more clear, to be honest with you. Lewis? <laughs> Don't like to say this, but sometimes we have to ask the question, are we ashamed of the gospel? Yeah. Those who continue to put excuses up for not being baptized, even though they can read the words of the scripture, in the long run, they're not going to be faithful to that because they're not committed to what the scripture says. The word ashamed is, is, a, is a harsh word, but it's a truthful word. As Christians, yeah. are we ashamed of the gospel? Those that are who are here this evening are core members. I look at those as core members because I'm not saying the ones who are not here aren't. <coughs> when we are here this evening, we, we, we are really shown a, a, a greater interest in some might not. Yep. And I think that is true. Not to say we, those are not ashamed of it, but we got to stand up for it, the gospel yep. and, and, and stand up for baptism and stand up for these beliefs. In my sermon this morning, I said we have to live for something greater than ourselves. Amen. And in order to live for something greater than yourself, sometimes you have to put other things and other people before yourself. And so some will ask the question, go ahead, Randy. I was going to say, if you read on in Romans, Paul says, uh, through baptism and belief and action, we're reconciled to God yeah. because we're made free from sin. We're also justified. We're made just as if we have not sinned. Yep. And those are important things. And, and we're sanctified. We're set apart yep. for holy, good yep. works. You've been washed, Three things that we want all these to happen to our lives yep. when we obey and are baptized and dedicate our lives. Yeah. Yeah, in Romans chapter 6, as Randy's talking about, when you're baptized, you know, you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified, right? You've been made right in the eyes of God. If you go over to Hebrews chapter 9 and 10, we're not going to turn there, I'm just saying, but it, later on when you have time, and uh, we know that. Uh, there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood, right? Whether in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Russ? Uh, I have a Bible study on Tuesday nights so and this couple that I'm studying with, they, uh, they see that it says believe and be baptized, but uh, they told me that they just don't believe what Jesus said. There. Yeah. They've been, and I think the problem is they've been, it's been hammered into their minds yeah. for many years, faith only uh, salvation. Yeah. Yeah. Bible oh, yeah. Put Jesus' words above yeah. what they've been taught for 30 years. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, even myself coming out of Catholicism and, and talking to others, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, Jenny, when she came out of the Baptist Church and all the conversations and Bible studies, you know, we had and then what Thomas, you guys had as a couple and then what you've had with other people. Uh, you know, you, you think about these things. It, it, it takes a while to work through all this stuff, you know what I mean? Especially if you weren't born and raised in the church, you know, hearing the truth from the from infancy and, and on. And so, you know, it, 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 yeah, James chapter 2, faith alone is dead. And so it's just so very important that, you know, as we continue to plant these seeds, that we ne make sure that we never compromise on this, right? Because Jesus isn't going to compromise on this. He will not compromise on this. And, you know, some people say, well, is that a scare tactic? You know, are we trying to scare people? No, we're not trying. I mean, well, in a, in a sense, you should be terrified to fall into the hands of a, of, a, of a loving God, a loving and righteous God, right? Who's going to up, uphold his law. And that's the key is that when our kids are no longer at that age of, uh, of self, you know, when they're no longer at the, at the when, they, when they come to the age of accountability is what I'm trying to say, right? And so people say, well, Dave, well, when does somebody come to the age of accountability? I said, let me ask you this. Uh, if you're talking with your child and you ask them, hey, have you ever told a lie? Okay, yeah, I told a lie. And this is just a simple example. Uh, did you know it was wrong to lie? Yeah, I knew it was wrong to lie. So did you make the decision to lie anyways? Yeah, I made the decision to lie anyways. You're no longer saved. Because now you know what sin is, you know what the consequence is, and you decided to do it anyways. How can you, you're no longer in a safe state. Do you understand that concept, Russ? Yeah. We've just got to reiterate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And with love, share with them. And yeah. Eventually, I think the, the word will work into their heart. Oh, yeah, for it sure. It takes years. It, it, could take, it could take months. It could take years. Yeah, for sure. I remember I, even my brother Paul and his wife Julie, I remember we were working with her every Saturday for six months. You know, and then eventually I was leaving stuff behind. I was leaving tracks. I was leaving information. I was leaving CDs, right? And as I was leaving all this information behind, I remember we were like six months in. And she said, hey, keep bringing the stuff when you and Christy come. Why? She goes, because as he's eating breakfast, he's reading it. And then it was a, a, little, bit, a little bit later down the road. He said, hey, can I join in the study? I said, absolutely, you can join in the study. You know, and eventually they were both, you know, baptized eventually. But, uh, again, that's a, that's a whole other conversation. But... It, it does take time, you know, but we have those of us who uh, had the, the privilege uh, to, to grow up in the Lord's church and to, to hear the truth from just being little nuggets. And so I'm here to just encourage you, if you're here tonight and you believe that Jesus is the, is the Son of God and you wish to dedicate your life to God, that's all it needs to begin your journey, to become a disciple of Jesus Christ to be added to the church, to have your sins washed away, you can do it here tonight. You know, brethren, when we look at this information, some will also ask, and they have asked, but doesn't the Bible say that Christ saves us? Well, yeah, the Bible says that Christ saves us. But how can, how can baptism saves us, uh, save us if Christ saves us, some people will ask. Well, consider Noah and his family for a moment. God was the authority and the power that saved Noah, yes or no? God was the authority and the power that saved Noah, and the water was the method in which he saved Noah by. Amen? The ark was the place, the ark was the a place that saved Noah and his family, but they were saved in the ark through the water. But God is the power and the authority. Likewise, under Christ, Christ and his blood are the authority and the power that saves. Amen? Baptism is the method in which he saves us, and the church is where the, the saved are placed. So you can see how, when you go back and you look at that first verse, we looked at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse probably about 18 through 21, 17 through about 21, uh, where it talks about the flood. It talks about that being a type, right, uh, of salvation. And so, and, and, and baptism is like the flood. And so, both Christ and baptism now saves us because Christ Jesus is the power and baptism is the water, which is the method in which Jesus instructs. That's why he says in Mark 16, 15 and 16, those who believe and are baptized. It's not one or the other. It's, it's both. And it's kind of like that biblical faith I'm always talking about, that belief and that trust and that, and that uh, obedience working in harmony. 
If you believe the word of God and you trust what and you trust uh, God, well, then you have to follow through with obedience. So after I believe, then I have to be baptized, not to join a congregation, but to be added to the universal church. Judy, um, uh, going back to another point, uh, it's sad that some you know a lot of people say, but I do believe in God, and I haven't murdered anybody. Yeah, you know they fall back on. Just the Ten Commandments. I haven't murdered yeah. anybody. I haven't stolen. I, you know, I'm not a liar. Yeah. And, and not even just being a good person. I haven't done anything yeah. wrong. And we've heard that from people. Sometimes you have to have a conversation. You just got to be lovingly, but you also have to kind of just be upfront. And so sometimes if I'm having a conversation with teens and they still think maybe they're in a safe state, I ask them questions. Say, so have you ever lied? Yeah. Have you ever stole anything? Some yes, some no. All right. Have you ever cheated? All right, some yes, some no. Have you ever? And just start asking all these questions. And then all of a sudden, they start to see there's a, there's a, there's a list of sins that they willfully committed. And I say, how can you be in a safe state if you willfully sin against God's commands, against God's standard? And that's the thing that we have to come to understand. And it's not just our teens, our adults. Maybe you're one of our adults here that, tonight that have not been baptized. And we're not talking about infant baptism because I was baptized as an infant, but you can't hear the word as an infant and then determine intellectually whether you believe it or not. And so infant baptism is a baptism of man. It's not a baptism of God. In infant baptism, you can't confess that Jesus is your Savior. Yeah. And you don't get a vote. You can't confess. Somebody convert. bigger than you yeah. stuck you in the water yeah. and poured something over you. Yeah, you yeah. You get a vote. You need to commit to that. Patrick. I just learned, learned something new about that whole phenomenon. I didn't know the infant one? Infant baptism. Yep. And, and, that, and um, the ba infant baptism is so that you protect their, they think and they're protecting and saving a child until they get to a point where they can make that, con that confirmation. Where they do the confirmation. The confirmation is supposed to be a seal mm -hmm. of that baptism yep. and that you're making, that you are saying, then it yep. is a personal thing. So that's why they're saying, well, you are making a personal choice. Yeah. You're just doing it later because well, we did the other part for you earlier. Yeah, they do the other part for you earlier. <laughs> but it's so right. And, and what, what they're protecting them from like in the Catholic Church is yeah. the, the stigma of original sin. Well, the child had nothing to yeah. do with original sin. Yeah. It's the stigma of original sin, but it's also because the Catholic Church teaches that if the baby, if the child, if even a, a toddler dies without being baptized, then they're lost. They'll be in limbo. Yeah. They'll never be in heaven. They'll never be in hell. They're just kind of floating out there in limbo. And so they baptize the baby uh, because of original sin, so that way the baby won't be lost and floating out there. But we know that Jesus says, do not hinder the children from coming to me. Yep. He says, for their angels, uh, 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 their angels stand before God. And we know that it talks about how uh, that if you wish to, if you desire to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you need to become like these little children. Why? Because they're innocent, they're pure, right? They're innocent and they're pure, but there comes a time when that little, innocent, pure, beautiful little baby no longer is innocent. And it's because sin has entered into the picture. You see, there's sometimes where, you know, I remember, and this is, a, this is how you can know whether or not they're still in that pure state versus the unpure state. I remember uh, when my boys were little, they did the safety town. You guys remember safety town, and they'll talk about stranger danger, and they'll talk about all these different things. And, and they're young, five, six, seven, and, and they're like, you know, they just couldn't wrap their mind around why somebody would want to abduct them, and somebody would want to sexually abuse them, or somebody would want to, you know, fill in the blank. They, they just couldn't understand that, right? Because they're innocent and pure still. But they get to a point, and, and I can tell you, if you're in the public school systems now, you guys know what I'm talking about, they're becoming less and less innocent yeah. much at a much earlier age mm -hmm. because of what's going on and what's being taught and what they're seeing in society and what they're seeing on TikTok and what they're seeing on social media and what they're seeing, right? And so they're losing their innocence younger and younger and younger. What they're seeing on television, right? All the sexual immorality and everything else. And so these, these, these once... Uh, these children who uh, one, at one point in time were innocent a little bit longer are now becoming less innocent uh, at an earlier age. And they're, they're, they're willfully committing sin. They're willfully going against their parents. They're willfully uh, going against the, the school teachers and the administration. And so how can one be in a safe state unless they are baptized, right? 
Because it's at that point that you're washed, you have your sins washed away. But then you have to start to learn what God expects of you. And as you start to learn what God expects of you, like I had to do in my early 30s, I had to then understand what God's teachings were and then start to make those life changes. Because people, I told you guys this a thousand times, people used to say that Dave's a good guy. Only because I wasn't in jail. Because I worked full time, I paid my bills, you know what I mean? I treated my wife with respect. I said, Dave's a great guy. But yet, I was doing a lot of things that when I read the scriptures, God said, Dave's an abomination. Right? Because we, you know, people were using worldly standards and not godly standards. And so sometimes I think we're, I, I just hope that our, our, our teens and our young adults don't think they're in a saved state when they're not. That's why I'm trying to be a little bit more blunt tonight. So if there's anybody here, I wish more of our teens were here because really I guided this, this, this lesson was more for the teens. Uh, I might even do this again from the pulpit and uh, change it up a little bit. Uh, but all of our teens and our young adults or even adults who have not given their lives to Christ need to understand what God's law requires. Yeah. Remember, the monarchy versus the democracy is a crucial concept. God doesn't re, uh, ask you to do these things. He demands these things to you if you require salvation. And, and oh, uh, Lewis and then Randy. A critical key to the baptism phenomenon, whatever you want to call it, is that we receive something during that time, yeah. the Holy Spirit. And that was a concept I'm trying to get over to the young people that you need the Holy Spirit, and the only way you're going to get it is this through yeah. baptism. And that is what Christ is yeah. coming back for, those who have the Spirit. Yeah. I mean, and it tells us in the book of Ephesians that, uh, that when you're baptized, right, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. Yeah. You're sealed. So God will know who his children are. Because if God came back right now, Amen. isn't it possible? Yeah. It says he's going to come like a thief in the night. We don't know when he's coming back. It could be, be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be another thousand years from now. The point is you don't know. And if you don't know, you need to make sure that you're ready. And if you believe that Jesus is the Christ and you want to live a life dedicated to God, that's all you need to begin this journey, to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so, brethren, we're going to uh, offer an invitation right now, just in case there's somebody here tonight who says, you know what, I do believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want to go to heaven when I die. I want to make, try to live and to grow and mature in my faith as I grow and mature in life. Brethren, if that is you and that is your desire, come forward as we stand and sing the song of invitation. <laughs>